All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the 19th. Yes, is it the 19th? Yes, it is. The 19th of June in the year of our Lord, 2022. Uh, yeah, uh, well, see, when you're retired, you know, one day is pretty much the same as the next. And yes, this is Sunday, and I'm, I will not be going to church today, unfortunately. And I want to talk a little bit about that. Um... Again, you know, there's the people, institutional pastors especially. And, of course, the ultimate example of that is the Pope of Rome. A self-proclaimed pastor in that case. <laughs> With authority he does not possess because that's not, that's not belong to Christ. Yikes. Uh, you know, somebody that is so arrogant... You know, that puts on the robes of piety. It's just like uh, one of his early acts in his papacy was to go visit the, the women's prison and wash the feet of some young ladies there. How kinky that is, right? Uh, but, the you know, it, it, the, it has the appearance of piety, uh, but he took the television cameras with him. Come watch me. Tape me broadcast me washing the feet of this showing how humble i am the absolute what's the word hypocrisy acting humble and pious when in fact you're you're doing it out of self motive and uh, just arrogance this is a man who has edited the lord's prayer and denied the commandments of God. He said uh, that there is no justification ever for capital punishment. When God, from the days of Noah, commanded that he that sheds man's blood by man shall his blood be shed. And th that's the, the uh, a function of government, to bear the sword, and not in vain. <sighs> But the great potato, the papa, El Papa, knows better, or La Papa, yeah. <clears throat> since he's a Spanish speaker. Uh, we'll just change the pronoun. <laughs> it makes a difference. Um... But uh, what I want to talk about, first of all, and it's related, is uh, there. I was watching about a half an hour of a video, current video put out by uh, uh, Conversations That Matter with John over there. Uh, he was a graduate of uh, Southeastern Baptist Seminary, Southern Baptist School. Uh, he's been in the process of uh, leaving the Southern Baptist Convention. But he reports on, uh, the title of the video is The Big Moment at the S at SBC 22. Now, I, I didn't watch the convention. I, I don't have the stomach to watch the convention. Um, I have a past connection, short-term connection with the Southern Baptists as a pastor. I found them insufferable insufferable uh, say and I want to talk about you know what do we do with that what do you, what do you do? how do we respond to uh, to worldliness in the church to to uh, the, the reason the reason churches compromise with the world 
Now they'll they'll justify. See, the problem with sinners is sinners always are, we are able we are able to justify our actions when in fact we our own heart might be deceiving us into into just doing uh, doing our own will and then justifying it in the name of Christ. That is a, 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 a sin is sneaky. The heart is deceitful above all things. I don't know if that is the, necessarily the the best translation of that, but it sure it's like it's pretty true. Uh, the you know the, we need a new heart, but the old one doesn't completely disappear immediately. The the sin dwells in our mortal body. That that is the problem. Well, you have the delusion, and I'm going to call it a delusion, of uh, sinless perfectionism among uh, some Methodists or uh, descendants of John Wesley. Uh, and he he himself didn't—some of his followers pushed that, and he did not deny it. He did not put a kibosh on it. And John Wesley was, you know, claiming to be—if he was claiming to be sinlessly perfect, he was an utter hypocrite because he was a manifest sinner. Now, if you read biographies of him, you have to read the right ones. There's a lot of biographies out there, popular biographies in the Christian market, that all they do is pimp these people as if they're some great heroes, and they don't show their flaws. Um, and we get ideas, and then we read, say, an autobiography, like John Bunyan, uh, you know, you read Pilgrim's Progress, and you can get an idea of how the great man this guy was, and how he went through all this suffering and everything else. But you read his own autobiography; he realized he was a sinner. And uh, I think John Bunyan was a great Christian, but a great Christian has to be realize their own flaws and their own sin. It's not just weaknesses and shortcomings either. It's our capacity, as long as we're in this mortal body, and God does give us free will, we have the capacity to choose what is wrong and deceive ourselves about it, try to justify our actions because it's something we desire or something we're trying to, to avoid. And we can always uh, find the, the human capacity for self-justification is very great indeed. <laughs> And you know that. You've done it. So at least if you're born again Christian, because we, we, we can, the Holy Spirit will reveal ourselves to us. We have to be able to see ourselves and not delude ourselves. The great delusion, see, uh, the popes, maybe they believe that they are what they say they are. They claim to be the vicar of Christ, the, the presence of Christ God on earth. They believe their own lies. And I think that is one of the frightening things. The other day I, I, I had a moment, uh, one of these uh, scary moments, where I was thinking about the, the Biden administration and uh, the, the American government, the American people, the elite. Let's put it that way, the elite. And I suppose this would filter down, but I'm just talking about the elite. I think they have believed their own lies. That was a frightening idea that they don't even know they're lying. People can become, lying can be such an ingrained pattern in uh, sinful human beings, unregenerate people. A Christian can't do it. The Holy Spirit will. You can lie, but the Holy Spirit will, will not allow you to get away with it. I mean, you will, he will convict you. Uh, He's a spirit of truth. And if he's in you, you can't get away with habitual sin and all. You, you know, he'll be confronted. He will confront you. God is a good father. He he will discipline his children. He, if, if God doesn't discipline you, you don't belong to him. You don't belong to him. But uh, the, the, the thought that that Biden actually believes what he says... He is so deceived, so self-deceived, that he believes his own lies. What can he do at that point? There is no repentance when you don't believe you have anything to repent of. When you don't have knowledge of your own sinfulness, how can you turn away? How can you turn to God when you don't realize 
your deed. You can't. That's why the Holy Spirit must convict the world of sin, of righteousness and judgment. And why the Bible warns not to close your ears when God does that, when God calls you to repentance and to him. Do not plug your ears. Do not harden your heart. Because to do that is to harden yourself to God's salvation or God's efforts to save you. Anyway, here, uh, uh, John over there at uh, uh, Conversations That Matter, well, they matter to Southern Baptists, but, and, you know, I think evangelicals, we, we should look at these things, even if you're not a Southern Baptist, and consider, and not just say, well, that's the Southern Baptist. It'd be easy to, to look at the, the gross sinfulness of, say, the United Methodists, which held out fairly well compared to the uh, uh, the Anglican or the Episcopalians. I've got to get the right church in the United States here. Uh, the American Anglican Church. And the, uh, what do they do with the Queen of England, by the way, there? And the, the Presbyterians, the PCUSA, the biggest, the mainline denominations. I mean, the, 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 there are evangelical Methodists, not the denomination, but, well, there are those two, but, I mean, there are born-again Bible-believing believers. I think even in Rome, there are some. How do you persist there? I don't know, with difficulty. Uh, and why are you persisting there? That's another question. But though they have all gone to hell. I think I mentioned the other day that, uh, well, from uh, wayoflife.org, a website, uh, Friday Church News, it actually comes out on Thursday. Uh, it's, it's worth looking at. I think uh, uh, David Cloud, although you might not agree with him on everything, is, you know, he's, he's really strong on uh, traditional uh, church music. And a lot of things... And, and sometimes I think he gets excessive on it. I mean, either you can you can find a fault, and then you can emphasize it so much that you you miss the issue, and pe other people miss the issue. There, there, I think, but I think there's an underlying issue that's behind his uh, his big thing. He's done lectures on the corruption of music, and I think he is a musician himself. Uh, and started out, he liked loved rock and roll. So he was, was we're sort of, I never loved rock and roll, but uh, he's, he's, I think he's only slightly older than me, so we're contemporary in many ways, both saved out of sinfulness. All Christians are saved out of sinfulness. Could be a little, could be a lot, but it was there. But uh, the the Southern Baptists, there, there's a clip, I think that I, I only watched 30 minutes of this. It's it's an hour and 25 minutes long. Uh, I might watch the rest of it later since I'm not going to church this morning. <laughs> but it's it's the reason I'm not going to church this morning is like a a precursor that the the Southern Baptists are the epitome of what's wrong with American evangelicalism. Uh, Billy Graham was a Southern Baptist. I think Franklin Graham is Southern Baptist. Southern Baptists, there's a problem, there's a mixture. Southern Baptists in the South, Southern Baptists, it's a cultural institution. But it's definitely an institution. Yeah. Um, and I have to say, the, the, there's a, about a seven-minute clip of Rick Warren in here, which is the, the subject, the big moment at the SBC, uh, is apparently was... Uh, the attempt by someone or some people there to uh, expel uh, Rick Warren and his church because he had ordained uh, some women, about three women, as uh, to some sort of a pastoral role. Uh, without knowing the exact things, but if Rick Warren did it, it was probably abominable. But it certainly wasn't done for a biblical reason. Uh, 
is there now the problem the real issue and and john gets on this a little bit but he hasn't seen uh you know it, it's like the the movie matrix you have uh neo otherwise known as mr anderson uh begins to see there's something not right. And then he's given the, the opportunity to take the red pill and see how deep the rabbit hole goes, referring to Alice in Wonderland. Uh, and becoming born again and coming to Christ is, is a little bit like that. You you start beginning to see with the light of Christ in you, you begin to see the problems with the world. And depending on your situation, you might be in a situation where it be, you quickly are confronted with the, the choice between the world and Christ in a very definite and explicit way that has immediate consequences for your life. And it did with me. The situation I was in at the time was the military. And it was like, okay, what do I do with Christ and the military? Who's Lord? And that was the, con the issue that confronted me, and I would be able to speak about that much more eloquently, if I could speak eloquently at all, about that, about that subject today after 46 years. Uh, then than I could, than I did then. I fumbled about a little bit then, but I was still confronted with the issue of who is Lord. And basically, I thought in all honesty, I had to tell my commander, I'm a Christian now. Uh, Christ is Lord. Not the American government, not the President of the United States. And I was in a position where I had a top-secret cryptographic clearance uh, working at a, uh, with the Strategic Air Command. I think at that time we were actually into a separate unit outfit that was uh, in communication services. And the uh, everybody involved in that kind of position that is working uh, with nuclear weapons, even if indirectly, they have a human reliability program, and I was not reliable anymore. I couldn't, you know, I think the commander asked me, uh, one of the things he asked me, called me in, <laughs> and he asked me a question. Would you ever, under any circumstances, do anything to prevent the launch of a nuclear weapon? And I was honest. I told him, you know, if you ask me an open-end question like that, I have to say there possibly could be, under some circumstance, that, that I might do something given the opportunity to prevent something. And I said, I've seen the movie Dr. Strangelove. But, see, the military will not accept that. They will not accept... You having moral responsibility to God. Any, any allegiance that transcends allegiance to the President of the United States. I cannot imagine, as a Christian today, serving Joe Biden. I can't imagine it. I could not do it. And anybody that's voluntarily submitting themselves to the military today. What is wrong with you? Who are you working for? You're not protecting the America. Biden is destroying America. He's destroying your family. He will destroy your children. He's destroy he is the destroyer of everything. Oh, wow. Just wait. The chickens are coming home to roost, but that's the judgment of God. But, I mean, this is a, an anti, a ungodly, anti-Christian man who's probably under the deception that he's a Christian because the Pope told him so, the Antichrist Pope. 
seems to have no problem with Joe Biden, the baby butcher. Ay, caramba. The, the enemy of the Constitution. Hey, this, is a, this is a contradiction, too, because even if you're enlisted, too, you swear an oath to uphold and defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Well, what happens when the President of the United States and the party in, in power and the institutions themselves have become enemies of the Constitution? <laughs> You can't. How? Well, you're 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 taking an unkeepable oath if you obey, because you're 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 also uh, taking an oath to to obey the president and those in authority, but the those in authority are the enemies of the constitution. It's a self contradiction. Anyway, I found myself in a situation that suddenly I realized, hey, wait a minute, this is there's a problem here. Christ is Lord. Now what do I do? Well, I told the commander, Christ is Lord. Not that I was looking to prevent the... the I didn't have anything necessarily at that time against uh, nuclear weapons other than to use them would be absurd. I mean, once deterrence has failed... You know, say that the once the uh, or you know once you actually uh, decide to use the things, at that point they become useless and destructive of everything. You know, when vengeance amounts to destroying all life on Earth, that's not a good kind of vengeance. <laughs> like, oh, wait a minute. At that point, deterrence has failed. There is no point in launching. Why well, wipe everything out? Everybody. That's that's it. That's the problem. It's 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 uh, there's a there's a inherent insanity to it. Nuclear weapons are insane. They're, I mean, they're just non-usable. Even the small ones. Given fallout, you, you, they're, they're not usable. They have no practical use. The consequences of using them is worse than any benefit you might get. Ah. <sighs> But anyway, so I was confronted in that situation. So I, I started out immediately in a, uh, being born again into a situation that I had to choose between Christ and the powers that be. And that's been an ongoing thing all my life. Is we are constantly, we have to make that decision. Who are his allegiance to? And, and uh, I'm not perfect. You know, I have a body of flesh and there's things I like and... And, but it's constantly, and the, and the Lord is faithful that even when we uh, uh, get caught up in the things of this world to a degree, that he will open our eyes and say, what are you doing? I've had that happen in, uh, several times in quite dramatic ways. It's like you get all caught up in starting a business or something like that, and, and it, it just can, can consume your life. And you you focus so much on that. At least I'm a person that is. I am not a multi. I don't have multi processing capability. It's. I will, go this way or I'll go that way, and uh, I I tend to do one thing at a time. I can't handle multiple tasks. I'm not multitasking. I don't handle it well. I tend to focus on one thing. So. Uh, <laughs> You know, you can't, uh, I can't hand the, have the world in one hand and Christ in the other hand because that, that Christ is going one way and the world is going the other. It's like trying to, to live on top of the San Andreas Fault. Only the fault is in the middle of an earthquake. In progress, you get torn apart. So uh, anyway, uh, talking about being red-pilled. I started out being red-pilled right away. Others... It slowly sneaks up on you, and even, and I'll say the same thing: it's as uh, 
over time, you should be seeing more and more of the distinction between the kingdom of God and the call of Christ in the world. And the, the hatred of this ungodly system ought to grow in you. If, if you are content with the world and content with Christ, I have to wonder, how do you do that? Do they give you meds to do that? Bennies, maybe? I don't know. But, like, you know, and I'm, I'm, maybe it's because of where I started. Having to make that choice. And others have not realized, not that the others have, don't, other people, other Christians don't have to make the same choice, but it didn't occur in such a dramatic fashion. Or dramatic realization. I mean, there was others there, Christian brothers and sisters in the military. They weren't. They didn't have that conflict. Maybe it's because I, you know, I like to understand things, and they have to work together. And it's like, wait, how can this work with that? Without deluding yourself, without convincing yourself of falsehoods, uh, or you know, you, you can believe lies. You just don't realize they're lies. And so I, I think, like, John over at uh, the Conversations That Matter, is, is, he's getting the red pill slowly. But you have to choose. When you realize the truth, you have to make a decision. A lot of people haven't realized the truth yet. And Rick Warren, I mean, it, it's, there's a whole episode in here, and it just shows. I mean, Rick Warren is, is the epitome of what it means to be a Southern Baptist. Utterly carnal, pretending you're godly, self-deceived. He is utterly self-deceived. He's he's a his his uh, his his seven-minute boasting apology and boasting self-justification. We're so Warren-esque. Just like his book, The Purpose Driven Life, when he starts out saying, it's not about you. But then the whole book is about pleasing yourself, finding, finding your purpose. Not God's purpose, your purpose. It's like, it's like uh, John Piper's book uh, on um, Desiring God, Christian Hedonism. It's not about God, it's about you. Piper was totally self-deceived in that. That it's it's using Piper simply uses religion and the Bible to justify his own hedonism, and his he was properly labeled it Christian, quote unquote, hedonism. There's no such thing as Christian hedonism. That those are. Antonyms. A hedonist is one who's utterly self-centered, seeking his own pleasure. And Piper reveals that the, the per, that yet you seek your own pleasure using God to get it. To be happy, that's your goal. Everybody wants to be happy. That that's not that's sinful. I mean, that, that you would put your happiness at the top. That's your goal. No, your goal is to be like Christ, to become like Christ, to know God, to be set free from the quest for happiness. <laughs> what Was Christ seeking his own happiness? Uh, well, Piper would say he was when he died on the cross. Or is he seeking to please his father? His father's happiness. But see, if you're nothing but flesh, you can't even know there is such a thing. And Rick Warren is, I mean, if you wanted to t look at everything wrong with the Southern Baptists, just look at Rick Warren. But you probably say, what's wrong with Rick Warren? Or many will. Well, he has no idea what the gospel is to start with. Uh, he's utterly corrupt. And the, the whole issue with Rick Warren 
uh, the issue with him ordaining women. I mean, this is talk about straining gnats and swallowing the camel. Now, uh, ordaining women, uh, unless it's in some particular, I mean, I think biblically, women are not to be in a position of leading or teaching men. Uh, so there's, there might be certain areas where it would be acceptable, but they would certainly be under the authority of the church. And they could not exercise authority in that sense. But maybe over women, there may be... But even that, we have to be careful because you're, you're meddling. The reason for uh, the exclusion of women has to do with the order of creation. And this age, this does not continue into eternity. There are distinctions b between the role of men and women. And so women in the pastorate are related to cross-dressing. Violation of roles. Transgenderism. It, it's tied together. Even if you might not see it, but it's tied together. The, the, the reason why God does not allow women to rule over men goes back to the garden. And it's only in this age. So, it's not in heaven. Gender is irrelevant in heaven. It's part of the, the, the human cr biological creation. Purposes. If you're not having children, there's no purpose. Uh, now, well, I'm sure you can think of some other reasons for it, but where uh, conversations that matter... He talks about it, and he's correct. It's The problem is the loss of biblical authority. The Bible says women can't exercise authority over men. I would say they're not supposed to be doing it in the world either, but because it's the, it's the same underlying issue is there regardless. So a woman president, na nah. nah. Of course, I won't swear allegiance to any of them, so I will not pledge allegiance to America. No way. My allegiance is to Christ. You cannot serve two masters. You have to choose. You cannot be loyal to the world and loyal to Christ. And America is the world of the world. It is not the kingdom of God. Fourth of July is coming up. If if there's going to, I'm a, I'm afraid there's going to be mixing of that. See, I've for quite a few years I tend to avoid churches that right around the Fourth of July, church going to church because of the sinful offense of mixing the world with the worship of God. It's a sin. But most Christians in the United States do not see that. So here John realizes that the, the, the real issue, but it, again, the women in a position of pastor, they're, they're, they're an effect of the real problem. They themselves aren't the real issue so much. It's, it's a secondary thing. It's a manifestation of not being faithful to God's word when you put women in the pulpit. And historically, this, a lot of this started among the Pentecostals and the Holiness Movement, the followers of John Wesley, Salvation Army, another Holiness... Methodist offshoot. 
because John Wesley was not faithful to the scriptures either. He had his own ideas of authority and had his quadrilateral, where the scriptures was supposedly the major element, but then tradition and reason and experience are also authorities. No man can serve two masters. Now, tradition, reason, and experience go into how we understand the scriptures for good or for evil. How do you overcome false tradition and invalid interpretation of experience and corrupted reason? We're a sinful race. The flesh is, is an abiding problem. And if you don't think it is, you're deceived. Self-deceived. Now, so the, 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 the problem with women in the pastorate, what makes it incorrect is the scripture reveals that it's incorrect. So to, to violate the scriptures because you think, because you think it's a good idea, what happened, I can remember especially uh, William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army. <clears throat> His wife, Catherine, was much better, uh, tended to write his sermons because she was a better speaker. And she was more skillful at communication. She was smarter. And he deferred to her. She she thought she should be able, but she did not. Uh, the the uh, because of the, the part of the part of the problem with a, a false view of the Holy Spirit, and you start using experience as an authority. And William Booth basically because he loved his wife. This goes back, and the fact that she was. Uh, a better speaker than than William was. He he his ex his experience told him that why there's there's no reason she can't preach. She's better at it than I am. And therefore, because my experience has shown me this, and God must have made her better at it, God must intend for her to do it too. Who am I to say God that she can't preach when she's better at it than me? See, it's, it's, it's a deferring to reason and experience. He, the, he used, the, reason, the problem is, if, if you are convinced something, and you sort of want to go that anyway, you will come up with a reason to justify it. And so he permitted his wife to preach and to teach because he was not sola scriptura. Wesley was not sola scriptura. William Booth was a Methodist, part of the Methodist connection. And then he broke off because they started to tell him he couldn't do this and couldn't do that. So, see, he he became his, the authority. The, the whole idea of military uniforms and all these things were because people thought it was a good idea. And where are the where is the Salvation Army today? Where are they today? Are they, you know, uh, are they about preaching the gospel? Or have they become forgotten? Most people do not even know that the Salvation Army is a Christian denomination. They don't even know it because they've been so caught up in other works that they've nullified their usefulness to Christ or diminished it greatly. Let me put it that way. Nullify is too strong a word. And uh, John over at uh, thinking or at conversations that matter is correct, but the rabbit hole goes a lot deeper because the compromise over women in the pulpit, and these I don't think these were probably for lead 
positions, and the Southern Baptist Convention themselves has no authority over what what local churches do. They have no authority over ordinations or anything like that. And the local churches don't have to adopt the, the Southern Baptist faith and message. That's only for the, the entities of the cooperative institution uh, thing. It's a parachurch ministry. They have no more right to tell a local church what to do than the Billy Graham Evan Evangelical Association has. But unlike the, Billy Graham, the, the, uh, that ministry, I don't think they ask churches what they practice when they take their money and uh, attempt to uh, exercise authority over it. Now, Southern Baptists are trying to be a denomination. And the local churches are going to lose what they are if they don't get out of this monstrosity. But the, the rabbit hole goes much deeper. See, John hasn't discovered it yet. He hasn't discovered how deep the rabbit hole goes. With the corruption of Christianity, uh, institutional Christianity, and how deeply it's connected with the world. Historically, you're going back to at least Constantine, and the flesh was already producing these compromises uh, before that. Because Christians, sometimes the children of Christians, are not born again. And often you have born-again Christians that are still very carnal. Babes in Christ, as Paul says. They're acting carnally. They're, they're following the flesh. They're following their own will. And even before Constantine, there was a growth in sacramentalism. You know, if you can't see it, you have to have uh, sacraments you can see and touch. See, all this, this uh, the superficial corruption we see in Rome, the, the sacramentalism, where, like they say, the, 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 what's called the Eucharist, which is, is uh, uh, about Christ. It don't, Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. To, to take is as a hard literal is is not biblical. It is spiritually his body and his blood. It is in remembrance of his body. It's the, it, it, the, if that is literal, then the Passover lamb, Passover was literally the same thing as Moses putting the blood on the doorpost and the lintel too. There's Christianity uses language in a more uh, mature form, not so childish. But carnality Jesus said unless you're born again you cannot see the kingdom of heaven so a unregenerate person or a say a baby Christian that is that is not mature uh, spiritually matured to be able to exercise spiritual senses at all will have will want to see what he can taste and, and smell and touch he wants that. He wants the visible, the priesthood, the candles, the icons, the statues. All this came out of the flesh. And be the whole instant, the church becoming an institution and then wedded to the state, all came out of the flesh. Constantine bribed the people, the bishops that consented to come to his his uh, council in 325. Sent them home with lots of goodies and promises and government tax support for their salaries. See, they became employees of the state. Yikes, what a mess. And they swallowed it. They swallowed it. And those that resisted, well, they were exiled. Of course, a lot of the bishops refused to go. They just said, for example, some of them were saying, well, what does the emperor have to do with the church? Good question. But they had already institutionalized themselves too. So. 
The flesh is at work among those who call themselves Christians. And if they don't if they think they're holy beyond that, they are wholly deceived. Uh but uh, so there, there's a the rabbit hole goes really deep. The real issue is, do you belong to Christ, and how much do you really belong to Christ? Do you know you belong to Christ? And then trying to live in this world as a Christian and stay unentangled from the world as much as possible. How do you do that? That's what I've been struggling with for 46 years. How do you do that? It's like today. I didn't want to make a big big fuss about not going to a Father's Day breakfast in lieu of church service. Say, there's not going to be a church service at the regular time. What will happen there is apparently this is how they I think I went to one fellowship dinner and if I was a pastor I would try to correct some of these things but even then I'd be a little leery about trying to fix things because once it becomes this is how we do things I mean people just don't like change you know that like if you have a job and somebody comes along and they, they want to change your job, change how it's done. You don't like it because it's work to change. You, you've got habits developed. It's, it, you got where a system worked out. Even if it will, will change for the better, it's still a little difficult for a while. And we resist change. Sometimes for the worse. For example, uh, you know, I, Christian fellowship dinners, wherever they've been, tend not to be about fellowship with one another in Christ. People will talk. It's a, it's a socializing time, which is not necessarily bad. It's not bad, put it this way. But I would say it's like you don't socialize during the worship service. You socialize before and after. You know, if you want to talk to, to other people, come early and talk. Stay late and talk. Use the stupid building. Have somebody lock it up, you know, keep it open for a half an hour. Before and after, you know. And let people... Socialize, talk with one another. There's nothing wrong with that. But, you know, the conversation should be directed to Christian ends to a degree. Love one another. Encourage one another. Strengthen one another. That's what church is all about. That's why we meet together. Now, the problem with fellowship di dinners is if you, you probably have noticed this, it's really not focused on Christ. I think communion ought to be part of that. And that it has to be, uh, people should be instructed. You know, rather, you know, I, I was thinking, uh, how would I change things, hypothetically? And I was thinking, you know, how, how do you get people to remember to talk about like what God has been doing in their lives, to, to share that. I was thinking, will this be a good time, rather than just chit-chat, is have people testify that wanted to. I mean, not everybody wants to stand up and, and talk. People, some people have a deathly fear of it. I, I had a fear of that too growing up. I just, the idea of getting up in front of the classroom people and given a presentation or something. I hated it. I would literally, well, I'd get sick, even if I wasn't. <laughs> have to have an excuse not to go to school today.
I got over that after I was born again. But, obviously. Uh, <clears throat> but, anyway, uh, the, a pastoral role. I mean, if you're there, if you're supposed to be guiding the congregation, then it should be, you know, how, how can we work this? And, to, of course, it should be do, done together with the congregation to focus more on Christ, to make it truly a time of fellowship with one another and with him. Because if Christ, Christ has to be the center of a fellowship, dinner. And some people might not understand that, but that's because they're not, you know, they need to understand that. They need to grow up in that. And then how do you actually do that? You know, because it's it's so uncommon. Oh, we've never seen that before. How do you do it? I don't know. Let's, let's say, let's pray. Let's have God guide us. But to, but if it's not if Christ is not the center of a fellowship dinner, then what kind of fellowship it is? Because He is our fellowship. He is our koinonia. And a pastoral role, as far as what I'm concerned, I believe is is simply the role of an elder, a mature Christian, is is guiding people into the will and wisdom of God, guiding them not dictating to them, not saying, this is the way it's going to be, but guiding them to see that that is, th that is the will of God, helping them to see for themselves that that is God's will, and then, and you know, we should prepare in advance to thinking, okay, just like communion, you should have a moment, at least, of preparations. Now, what are, what are we about to do? This is not just motions we go through every month or whenever. The Scripture tells us to do this in a vivid recollection of what Christ did for us and for me individually. Him dying on the cross for our sins. And to me, that's the real role of a pastor. I, I think pastors are, it's, it's too, the church services tend to be much too pastor focused in general, all denominations. And, you know, we, how, how do we make and keep, how do we maintain the centrality of Christ in all things? And if we can't do it at church, the assembly of the saints, of course, Rick Warren does have no idea what church is. That's what it is, the assembly of God's people. How can we do it the rest of the week? If we can't keep Christ central when we gather together in his name, how can we do it the rest of the week? How do we live as Christians in a wicked world? But I didn't want to make a fuss, so I decided, well, I'll just absent myself. And then yesterday I visited, uh, we visited a couple people that, that attend there, and I just wanted to see how the, the gentleman was having, you know, they're elderly and having back issues. And, but, of course, uh, they asked, one of them uh, asked, are you going to be at the, the fellowship dinner tomorrow? And I said, no. I, I, I wasn't really looking for an opportunity to say this. Maybe it works out for the best, though. But then uh, it, why? And then I tried to explain. I said, I don't think that... We, we, I, I said, we have to maintain the holiness of the assembly of the saints. the uh, It's set apart to Christ and not mix the things of the world with that, even if we think it's a good idea. And I said that, that, that uh, Father's Day is of the world. It was invented in 1908. It's not, it doesn't come from the Bible. The Bible does not tell us to honor our father and mother one day a week. Or one day a year. 
So, and I said that, that this may be a small thing, but I, I do not want to simply ignore it because the small things lead to large things, large things. And I think I pointed out that once upon a time, Nazarenes were Methodists. And look where the Methodist church is today. And I mentioned the, the new songbook that they're publishing with 46 songs for the glorification of the queer, the LGBTQ, XY, plus, Z, whatever it is now. I think pretty much among that community, they just use queer as a general, as a general term. So, but the, the, a, a so-called Christian church, West, founded by Wesley, don't think he's happy. <laughs> he probably realizes his mistake, too. But even by, even those that, that ex, say, well, I'm going to get to that in a second. I better get to that. Uh, that people always have a tendency to do what's right in their own eyes. Oh, that seems like a good idea. What's wrong with it? What's wrong with it? Christ doesn't tell us to do it. That's what's wrong with it. And not seeing how this happens. See, when you've been a Christian for 46 years and lived on this earth for 21 years more than that or so, you, you begin to see how things work out over time. And the, the history of Christianity is a history of corruption as far as the institutions, people doing what was right in their own ideas. People, we think this is a good idea, including the idolatry that's present in in the old denominations, uh, the, the physical idolatry, the, the icons and the statues and the, the, uh, the worship of Mary, uh, the hyperdulia of Mary. I mean, they have theological excuses. They're just not biblical. And all these other things that have been added to corrupting Christianity. The, the celibacy of the priesthood. In, in Roman Catholicism. We think it's a good idea. We've got a problem with priests. Maybe if we just forbid them to marry, they'll become holy. No. What does the Bible say? The elder and the deacon, they have to be the husband of one wife. Well, we're not going to worry about the Bible thing. They didn't have Bibles. I mean, the, the, the people, most of the people didn't have any access to or any knowledge of the Scripture unless it was read, other than that which was read uh, in the services. And Roman Catholicism, and they, I mean, they still have, what, at least two Scripture readings. So that, that, but that's the exposure of most Roman Catholics to the Scripture. What occurs in the liturgy. But even, say, the Southern Baptists, which supposedly hold to the authority of Scripture and sufficiency of Scripture. I'm not sure about the word sufficiency. In their Baptist faith and message. Now, if they were really held to the authority in scripture, of Scripture and the sufficiency, why would they have a confession at all? Isn't the Bible sufficient? Apparently not because they had other ideas. They didn't see the inherent contradiction. But the, the Southern Baptists, I mean, on one hand, they, they, they say these things. On the other hand, they are so worldly. And that is what you, you've had in the convention that has been going down the downgrade into the abyss, following the world, and then justifying it themselves, especially starting with people like Billy Graham and the new evangelicalism that, that arose after World War II in reaction to the fundamentalism. The fundamentalism was, was against the world, militantly against the world, 
properly. It, it got a little bit coarse, though. Against the world in the wrong ways, like Billy Sunday crusading against alcohol. Not just drunkenness against alcohol at all. A baseball player crusading. I mean, he mixed things together. Prohibition and the gospel. They do not go together. He's not the first one. Uh the Booths, the Salvation Army, Catherine Booth, mixed these together because they saw the problems, alcoholism, drunkenness was uh, uh, was rampant in uh, the society, the the especially in the the underbelly of society where they were ministering. Booth, to his credit, tended to go to the worst places he could find. But he did not subject himself consistently to the authority of Christ, to the authority of the Scripture. And did a lot of things that the Salvation Army, him and his, his associates, uh, did a lot of things that were right and expedient in their own eyes. Like the militarization imitating the British military. It was right in their own eyes. The uniforms, all the brass bands, all this stuff was right in their own eyes. And where are they today? You see the Salvation Army, most people see them at Christmas time, the bell ringers. But those people out there ringing those bells generally are not even salvationists themselves. They're not even members of the Salvation Army. They're simply volunteers. Or people uh, that are part of their social service program is that they're, I don't know, maybe they ask them if they want to volunteer. I wouldn't be surprised. And they don't see the error of their ways. Our sin blinds. Sin blinds us. See, the Southern Baptist, Rick Warren, listen to his seven-minute self-congratulation apology that, uh, that uh, John over at uh, Conversations That Matter. This is the big event out of the, the convention 2022. Rick Warren's boasting about how wonderful he is and what a great thing he's been for the Southern Baptists. And basically saying in a backhand, what do you call that when uh, passive aggression, something like that, a backhand sort of way is, yes, you're about to kick me out, but uh, let me offer a defense. I'm so wonderful. What if, Look at all I've done for you, is essentially what he was saying without actually saying that. Oh, it's been such a privilege to be a Southern. He did it in such a way, he sounds like a politician. Deceitful. But nobody would recognize it, probably. Almost nobody. And he himself is thoroughly self-deceived. He believes his own words. I believe that he believes his own words. I believe that he thinks he preaches the gospel. When he doesn't preach the gospel at all. He doesn't even know what it is. See, the Southern Baptists, they're, they're, the whole existence for their entities is to proclaim the gospel, to plant churches. They don't know what a church is. They don't know what the gospel is. My experience, universal experience with Southern Baptists, is they're worldly. Not that they're all unregenerate, but they all tend to think to do what is right in their own eyes. Oh, this would be a good idea. That would be a good idea. And it's not just a Southern Baptist thing. Obviously. Look at where the ELC, the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America is. Look at the, where the United Methodist Church is. Look at where the Episcopal Church is. 
They do what's right in their own eyes. They, they conform themselves and to the world, and then they justify their love of the world and the conformity of the world with religious language. Sin is so deceitful. The capacity of human beings for self-justification, self-deception, is terrible. It's immense. It takes the Spirit of God, the Spirit of truth, the Spirit of holiness, the presence of Christ. The Holy Spirit is the presence of Christ in the assembly of the saints and in the individual saints. But we must walk by faith and not by sight, trusting in him to do his ministry and guarding the holiness of the assembly of the saints. So, without trying to make it, and maybe it's a good thing in the will of God that I was asked why I was going to, I didn't want to bring it up. I was hoping it didn't come up, but it did. And so today I assume that uh, if somebody has a question, if some people are going to be asking. I know they're going to be asking, a small church, uh, where are the Andersons today? And somebody's going to be there that can tell them why. I don't want to make a fuss about it because it is a small thing. But as I told the couple that, you know, small things grow. I don't want to make a huge thing, a mountain out of a molehill. But molehills tend to spread. So the, the point is that Christians need to resist largely by participation in. Uh, you can come out and make a very noisy fuss, but that's probably not going to convince too many people. I think it perhaps it's better that if we simply personally say, we're not going to participate in that. And say that largely by your absenting yourself. And let them ask why. And then you have the opportunity to uh, quietly explain why you think it's not right. Why it's not right for you. Why you won't participate. And again, we're having probably one of the most corrupting influences in the church, the mixing together of the world and the church, occurring in about two weeks with the 4th of July. The a Southern Baptist Church, they were having a regional, uh, it's just it roughly like a, a county area of down there, it was... Uh, it wasn't really the Southern Baptist Convention. They have state conventions and then regional associations. Also, Texas at that time had two separate state conventions of the Southern Baptists at war with each other. <laughs> Typical. But uh, <clears throat> the church that they had the meeting in, it was adorned. It wasn't even the 4th of July, but it was adorned with American flags. Every window it was a, an older style church building, you know, sort of a, a semi-cathedral style. And it had flags everywhere, including behind the uh, the pulpit, you know, where in a cla an older church would have an altar. They had a huge American flag that must have been 20 feet high, suspended there. That is abject idolatry. Abject idolatry. Many churches have a American flag in the front. You know, or to the side, and a Christian flag on the other side. And some churches have a flagpole with an American flag on it, and a Christian flag. Well, I object to that, unless, like on the flagpole, they put the Christian flag 
over the American flag, above it, proclaiming the lordship of Christ. But they do not do that. Better to fly just the Christian flag. Because, I mean, it's, it's uh, against proper flag etiquette to have any flag higher than the American flag. I object to that very idea. Christ is Lord, and Christians must live consistently to their ability with the Lordship of Christ. Or don't call yourself a Christian. No man can serve two masters. No man can love two masters. Who are you going to obey? That's the issue. You're going to obey Christ or yourself, what you want, what your flesh wants. We have to, especially in the assembly of the church, maintain that holiness, that it is Christ. He is our fellowship. He is our koinonia. He is our life. He is our sufficiency. He is all things to us. We all fall short of that. We have to realize that's the standard. We don't mix things with him. We don't, as the Old Testament said, we don't sow our field with mixed seed. It's like when you send missionaries into another country. You don't send them as Americans. You send them as servants of Christ forbidding them to bring American values and American culture, telling them you must live in the culture you're being sent to. And simply bring Christ and Christ alone. You don't come as an American missionary. You come as a messenger of of Christ and nothing else. And if you can't do that, we're not going to send you. We're not going to support you. You're there to serve Christ. And we're going to remind you of that frequently. But we've got to remind ourselves of that too, constantly. It's difficult to be a Christian, but it's easy. We just have to trust him, trust God to produce what he wants in us. Christian, the, our good works are his good works. They come out of him, out of the spirit. The fruit of the spirit is not something we produce but something that God produces in us.